Hi, my name is Shirley Reeder, and I am interviewing a veteran today, Colonel Von Holly. He is a veteran of the Second World War and the Infantry in the Pacific. We are at the Cincinnati Public Library. It is June 28, 2006, 2 p.m. And I am delighted to interview you today. I'll answer your question. Okay. And you, Colonel Von Holly was telling me how he got into the Army. Okay. You want me to repeat that? How you got into the Army. Repeat it. How did yes. you get into the Army? Yeah, okay. repeat it. I, went, I was transferring from Xavier University to the University of Cincinnati because I wanted to go into the law. Mm -hmm. And the advisor at University of Cincinnati said, if you, if you are drafted, do you know your number? And I said, no, I don't. I have a number, but I don't know when I'll go. He said, that's it. If you volunteer, you will be out by next September, and you'll be ready for school. Mm -hmm. But if, you, if you're drafted, we don't know when you'll get out. So I advise that you volunteer for the Army. So a week later, I volunteered for the Army. They sent me to Camp Wheeler in Georgia. This was in October. Mm -hmm. And by December, the war started with Pearl Harbor, and as a result, I had eight years of that. Right, activity. so that changed the parameters that there, changed, the one year, two year thing. All. Okay, also, if you volunteered, did you, did you not have a choice of which branch you went into? Well, you went to what they were called branch immaterial, and then when you went there after you, you first learned all the basics, mm -hmm. and then you took exams. Okay. And that puts you in this area or that area. Okay. But at, when the war started in, in, in December, mm -hmm. anybody with any kind of college background was sent to what they call a non-commissioned officer school. Mm -hmm. And at that school, in, in that time, there was 156 in my class. And they said the top 10% of the class would automatically go to officers' candidates. Mm -hmm. And I was in the top 10. Right. And they sent me to, to Fort Benning in the Infantry sure. Officers' Candidate School. I graduated from there in uh, July 4th, 1942. Mm -hmm. And then I was assigned to the 96th Infantry Division. And were you assigned as a lieutenant, yeah. second lieutenant? I was a second lieutenant. Right. Then um, you know you you achieved the rank of colonel, right? Yes. So how did well, that? Very few people achieved well, that. Well, I was rank. promoted up, and I was uh, when I went when I went into Okinawa. My that was my second. I first was lady right. in the Philippine Island, and that I was at that time I was 23 years old mm -hmm. and a captain. I had gone from a second lieutenant to captain. Yes. Now, and, uh, you talked about lady. I've always been fascinated by that battle. Can you tell me what your experiences were there? Well, yes. We, we were scheduled to go to Yap, which is the cable crossing in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. But MacArthur said that if, he, he, if Nimitz would give him enough horses, to land in the Philippines, he could hasten the war by at least nine months. Mm -hmm. So remember at that time I mentioned to you, we were under the knee. We were loaned back to the army to make Arthur to take him into the Philippines. And by coincidence, the my troops landed and on Lady on the same beach that the next day MacArthur came. On that same beach. So you were still under the Navy at that point? Were you still on with the Navy at that point? Were you oh, still yes. on loan to the Navy yes, at that yes. point? No, we were loaned to the Army. Okay. And now, was this before all the, the great naval battle or after? Well, the, the great battle of the... Uh, of Lady Gulf? Lady Gulf went on while we were on Lady. Okay. And we didn't know this at the time. But we had no air cover, uh -huh. and we had no navy ships. They were so busy fighting, and we were we were like orphans. 
and the, the whole island was swamped. That's what I got pictures of. Mm -hmm. uh, we landed, I said we were going to Yap. We had hobnail boots and uh, clickers on our chains on our vehicles and so forth. Then when we were transferred over practically overnight, within a couple weeks we were given to MacArthur to go into the Philippines. That was an all-army all show, the Navy, mm -hmm. the, the Navy took us there, but mm -hmm. in the Philippines. But we were all set for a coral island, and they dumped us off in the swamp. Oh, gee. And, uh, so, once we achieved the landing on the Philippines... Well, see, well, we, we get fought at Lady, uh -huh. and then about... 60 days later, mm -hmm. they landed at Luzon. Right, which is point. further south, is that right? It's Luzon, mm -hmm. it's a little more north than Okay, north. Okay, and then Manila is? Uh, on Luzon, that's Okay, it. gotcha. That's, that was the goal, wasn't it? Please. The goal was Manila, is that correct? Yes, yeah, yeah, but it wasn't for us. We just took Lady, so they would have a base to take Manila. Right, and the whole idea was Rita Cor Cor uh, Corregidor. Yeah. But then when we were withdrawn from the Philippines, we went back to Navy control. And then we were staged to go into Okinawa. Well, that must have been confusing going back and forth like that. <laughs> yeah. But when, when you're thinking of 26,000 men, that's. Wow. How many divisions was that? Um, three? Just one Just division. One. Okay. Well, but there was also the 7th Division and the 77th Division. So you're talking about 75,000 men getting swapped back and forth. Wow. See, so I don't think too many people know about that going on during the war. But we were all on the same team, so it makes sense. So once we achieved the Philippines, we had a base that was closer to Japan, right? And yeah. then the next step was... Well, then the next step was to take Okinawa, mm -hmm. so we would have a base to take Japan. Right. And at Okinawa, the Japanese changed their complete battle uh, ideas mm -hmm. because at every one of the islands where, were the, where we landed and where the Marines landed like it, and, and see, 30 days before we went into Okinawa, that's when they went into uh, where, where the Marines are famous. Iwo Jima? Hmm? Iwo Jima? Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. And they, they took Iwo Jima to have a base so we could take Okinawa. Right, because Okinawa, was that not going to be the base for the invasion of Japan? Oh, yeah. We were only 400 miles right. from Japan. Right. Did you experience any of the kamikazes in Okinawa? Oh, yes. Constantly. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, I don't like to talk about them, but they were just wild about us. They would attack at night, mm -hmm. and they would scream to us, and when they would huh. attack, they would all as we understand, they'd all get all very high and drunk from oh, sack and kidding. stuff like that. And then they would attack us. And if, as they attacked us, it was like the crazy Indian shows you see mm -hmm. now. They'd scream and howl that uh, uh, we hate Babe Ruth. Uh, You're kidding. <laughs> oh, uh, yes. So did they scream that in English so you could understand? Yes, eat hot dogs, oh, <laughs> anything. But they were all terrible fighting, terrible fighting, hand to hand. You know, it was. It was they were. Were they in caves and all in Okinawa, like That's they, a lot like of they were in And we did uh, not not a lady. Right. So that was all. But at, at Okinawa, there was a lot of cave fighting. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a new weapon at that time. It was called the flamethrower. Mm -hmm. I guess you got heard from others. That, and the flamethrower, it really wasn't the flame that killed people, but it was an exhaust, all the oxygen at one time. Mm -hmm. And it would 
just kill you like that. Um, you couldn't breathe, just poop. Hmm. And that's the way we got them out of the caves and stuff like that. But we had a lot of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The only actual one I like to tell about, or not tell it, that I will tell, but all the rest, you can't imagine how horrible it was. I mean, we'd have blood all over us and bodies and all over. But when we went into Lady, that was my introduction to fire. I, everything had been training up until mm -hmm. then. And when we went into Lady, the, the, the men were all almost relaxed. I mean, we knew we were going to go into the enemy, but this was just like another training. Mm -hmm. And we're all, including me, I mean, this, this is something we've been doing for months, training to do this. But when the ramp went down and we rushed ashore, and we had to go through the sand of about four, 30, 40 yards to get in, and the Japs were just pouring fire at us. And as I was going to the, we're trying to run to get to the foliage on the end of the jungle or whatever it was, I looked to my right, and one of my sergeants was running without a head. That's when I, uh, that's when I knew no longer dream. Oh, yeah, man. And that, that just changed me for you. Oh, so bad. So when you went in Okinawa, you had a whole different At perspective. Okinawa, that was a different thing. And if you read in my book there, when we went into Lady, we were all just like, football players going into a football. But we went into Okinawa, everybody was saying, oh, will I see the sun go down tonight? You know, we really, yeah. and that's when we had to go over on that picture, over the wall and down. But then that's when I said, the Japs had completely changed their theory of fighting. They didn't try to stop us at the waterfront. Mm -hmm. They sucked us in. And on the seventh day that we were there, that's when we said the honeymoon's over. That's the day we ran into real fire. Oh, gee. But for seven days, I mean, Okinawa's a beautiful island. And from what I understand from writers that were with us, they said it, it was just like Italy. <laughs> it's hmm. beautiful. And, and, and then it's, it's one great big, Reminds me of Kentucky Hills, the whole greens are up there, and then they started to pour fire down on us. Oh, and they, they hit our tanks and they just burned like pork. But after nine days of fighting, what had been a big, beautiful mountain was now just like a sand rail. It just blew everything. But we, for, for nine days, we were given the orders to attack. And for nine days we attacked, and we never moved long farther than a football field. They were driven back by their withering fire. Oh, I mean, it was, and then that was when I was hit on the ninth day. You were hit? Yeah, I was wounded. Oh, and uh, and I was sent back to the island of Guam in the Naval Hospital. Mm -hmm. And then after I was in the hospital back there about, I guess, almost four weeks, or three weeks and four days, they put us back on a plane because we were getting into the final attack on Okinawa and orders were anybody that could even walk. Isn't that something? So you, you, they sent you back. They sent you back. They sent you me didn't back. get to go home. No. No. Well, then I got back and the third day I was back, I was hit again. They sent me back to the 204th Naval Hospital, and I was scheduled to be operated on. And then that's when they dropped the atom bomb and said, anybody that was in a case like me or others that, that you were going to operate over there, they sent us back to the States to be operated on. Okay. So if you look at a globe or a map, I, they actually flew me from Guam to Cambridge, Ohio. Oh my gosh. Almost exactly halfway around yeah. the world. 
So you were operated on in Cambridge? Yeah, but then, they, then they decided not to operate because I had what they call a brachial plexus energy. My arm, I still got shrapnel in it, but my arm was paralyzed. And the doctors keep saying to me, yeah, it, see if they would, it, it, it was a, the board had to look at it. If they turned you loose like a like a condition, they'd have to give me 100% disability. But they kept saying, we can rehab this guy. That mm. that vein would grow back. Looks like and they did. Now I can only raise that arm that oh. much. But it, my heart, I wasn't in a bed, so to speak, but I was a hospital patient for mm. 21 months. Oh, gee. And then, so, did you continue in the service after this? Or did you continue in the service after you were yes. rehabilitated? Well, when I, when they transferred me to the reserves, mm -hmm. and I have what they call 30% disability okay. with this arm. So, I could stay in the reserve, mm -hmm. and I did 23 years of reserve duty, and that's when I kept up. I was discharged or transferred, not discharged, from the regular army to the reserves as a major. Okay. And then in the reserves, I was promoted to a light colonel and finally to a colonel because I was a, I had a, a really plum type of reserve duty. A lot of the guys didn't want to, the officers stayed, but many of the men didn't want to stay because they had to go through all that old training. Right. Things. But in all, I was called an amphibious expert. Mm. And I was, I guess, 12 or 15 different army posts in my career of 23 years. I was sent to different army posts and I would teach amphibious training. I also, five different times, I was taken back. I would go to Navy schools to re-up in all the, so I could go out and keep teaching to the Army amphibious training. So that was my career. So essentially in the amphibious training, was it mainly teaching them how to be on these type of landing crafts and how to execute a landing? Yes. Well, see, there's, it's a little different. It, I, best way to explain it, it it'd be a, between amphibious training and army training would be as much difference as there between football and basketball. Right. You're both in both games. You're attacking. You're trying to win, but there's complete different theories the way you do it. Right. You want to talk a little bit about the amphibious, just for. How, how that's executed because I don't think a lot of people understand. Yeah. I guess the way in the way they're doing it now, I've been out for 12, 15 years. The way they're doing it now, I would have no idea how they. No, just but 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 the main things that you had to be skillful in at that time yeah. to be an amphibious officer. Yeah. What what would that be? Well, you still had been. Mm -hmm. and but, uh, and, and, but basically, in the Army, you, you attack and use diverting this way. Mm -hmm. and, but in the, in, in the amphibious, you don't, it was, it's all more, all small, like way to warfare. Okay. We, we would be, in, in today's world, an amphibious soldier would be great to fight terrorists. You don't meet them in the front. It's, it's, it's constantly little fighting them in the little foxholes and hunting them out and get them that way. That's, that would be a big difference. Where the army, they still you know, have a frontal attack and, and fight this way and have an envelopment around. Mm -hmm. But you don't fight terrorists that way. You ferret them out. Yeah, right. And that's what we had to do. We have to go find these jab cells, and then when we would find them, usually there was, wasn't a whole lot of day fighting. It was all night fighting, mm -hmm. because that's when they'd come with their band size. But then when they, 
Okinawa. That's what they did instead of fighting us that way. They kept drawing us in and getting us with long range fire. And then that's when we had a use of flamethrowers and stuff to, to dig them out. Dig them out of the caves. See, that would be the biggest difference between uh, D-Day in Normandy, where they just kept sending troops in. Right. This, this was one that I, I think General MacArthur was a great general, but he did that for the human life. Mm -hmm. You know, just send people in. Hmm. Just fall down, send more people, send more people. Sort of like Patton that way, I expect. Patton was that way too. Just utter force. Just men, men, send them in. To, you know, where we didn't do that, we, we did all this. Ferreting it around the corners. Mm -hmm. We still had enough casualties, but out of my my group that I was in charge of, and as I said, I was 24 years old and a captain. I had 236 men under my command, and 96 of them were killed. Oh my gosh! Let's see if if, if we would have fought another way. We'd probably all been annihilated or something. You know? That's amazing. That was one of the heaviest casualties of the war was in Okinawa. Is that not right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we I only had three killed in, in Blady. But again that was jungle fighting. Mm hmm yeah. So you experienced a couple of very different types of warfare there. Yeah. Um you probably wouldn't have been involved in the invasion of Japan then because you were in the hospital at that yeah. point, right? Well, well, my unit, Your unit we were been. staging to go into Japan. What do you think that would have been like if we would have had to do oh, it? That would have been a catastrophe. When I, my blood just boils and I get goose pimples when I read about these bleeding hearts who said we shouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'd have won the war if we had to go into Japan. We hadn't dropped that out. Right. right, that was my next question, was what your feeling is about the atomic because bomb. Japan was, women and, like England, women and children were armed to fight back hmm. if we'd have gone into Japan. You're kidding. I know that a million casualties were estimated yeah. if we'd have had to yeah. invade Japan. That was... That was very necessary, mm -hmm. and a God said that out of all. Did you, were you there at the time of the atomic bomb? I was in, in the hospital on, on Guam. So you didn't actually experience that? We, we knew, we knew something was happening in the hospital. Mm -hmm. I was in a bed then, I was a bed patient. And we had this eerie feeling because the way they had changed security and Everything I did is, you know, you, hmm. you have a feeling something's going to happen. We didn't know. But then when they read it, they dropped the first bombs. Nagasaki way. You probably were in the service when President Roosevelt died. What, yes. What, what, well, what, I was, what were your feelings and what were the soldiers' feelings? Well, it was like, I, I think, to the average trooper. It was like losing your dad. I had just, the first time I was wounded, I told you, I was just getting out of the hospital the day I got that message that Roosevelt had died. Was it a shock? Please. Was it a shock? Was it oh, unexpected? Yes. It was, as I say, it was just like losing your dad. We all felt that he and Churchill knew so much of what they were doing. And he had been president most of your life, right? Uh, he had been president most of your life. Yes. He probably barely remembered the other presidents before him. Yeah. He'd been president yeah. for such a long time. First man I ever voted for. Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of a... Do you, I know the, the war is very serious and a, a horrible thing. Are there any kind of funny stories that came out of this that you would like to share? Any kind of funny incidents that happened well, in your training or in the time over there? Yeah, we, uh, 
one of them sharing, and I think I got to be excused for the party. But when we went into Okinawa the night before, and I said to my executive officer, we were standing up and irritated the women, men sharpening their knives and get, all getting ready to go into battle the next day. And I had my, my junior officers checking all the men at the end of the ammunition and all And my, uh, I said to my executive officer, or he said to me, boss, they called me. He said, boss, I don't know which one of us is going to see the sun go down tomorrow night. But he said, they might hit me, but they're never going to kill me. And I said, okay, Jim. He said, I got to go. Okay. Yeah. Your wife gave me some ideas. <laughs> okay. Well, I was, where I left, <coughs> left off there, I was telling you that my executive officer and I were talking, and uh, we were maybe 20, 30 miles on ship off offshore, and we could see the, the bombing and the plane going in and so forth. Now, this is the night before. <clears throat> and I said, Jim, whichever one of us survives this damn thing, let's name our first boy after. And he says, that's a deal, we shook hands. And today, my oldest son is called James Redden Von Holly. Oh, wow. And now his little 10 year old boy is called James Redden II. <laughs> oh, how neat. So he didn't survive? No. And, and he, yes, he survived. He yeah, didn't. He, did. oh, he, was, he was killed the day Gosh. in the same battle I was wounded. So he sort of somehow knew. He knew somehow that one of you wasn't going to make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing. And then I was instrumental in getting his body brought back from Okinawa to Washington, D.C., where he lived. And his family had kind of adopted all my kids, and we, they became almost like relatives. That's really nice, you know? The mother sent our son that's named after him. The officer that you know he was fighting with sent his football and basketball awards when he, that he got in high school. Isn't that nice? Yeah, yeah it was really the nice. The mother sent all this. Anyway, then they, she said, they said, tell the story. The Japs were indoctrinated. The Japanese mm -hmm. were indoctrinated that we were such vicious people and we raped women killed little kids and killed all the old people. That that's why they kept when they fought us, they were all uh, to hell with Babe Ruth and Yankees eat hot dogs and stuff like that. Hmm. Well anyway, as we I was back to the the battle again, the closing days of the Okinawa. And there was a, a on Okinawa, there was a girls' monastery, and when the the Japs would, had surrendered, and we were going to take over, fifteen girls from this monastery held hands and jumped off of a cliff because we they were afraid we were going to rape them. Amazing. And that's to this day that's always referred to as the Well of the Virgins. But then they found it was the other way. All we did was give candy and food and everything like that. The American GI was kinder to the people of you know the alien of, of the enemy countries than anybody else, certainly than the Japanese or the Russians for that matter too. I think so, the Germans t told the women the same thing that you know to kill yourself before, but, but not about us, but about the Russians. They said the Russians would break and kill them. And, and I guess today we could say they're one of our best allies, you know, like England. I mean, and over here, their the cars Japanese. are out selling. Oh, all yes. Sir. Yeah. And like this morning paper, mm -hmm. how many uh, 
restaurants and kids are mm -hmm. going to eat with chopsticks and everything like that. And that's what's going to happen in, in our rain. You think so? Oh yeah, they're, they're talking. Those new, it, I have uh, friends whose sons are serving in Iraq. And they're all in, not just soldiers, but they're in positions of, the one is a sergeant major, which is like a four-star general. Hmm. You know, that, and he writes stories about, you should read his letters. I mean, what do you think that the little girls can go to school now? Women don't wear veils on That's their right. faces. And all That's that. right. It's going to take time. If yes. the newspaper people will just write it up. Absolutely, right. they'll write it correctly. What would you like to tell the future gen young people today and future generations about what you all went through during that period of time, during the war years? Is well, there any advice or anything you'd well, like to I tell people? The uh, only thing I can say about civilian life is what I hear from other people. But I, I mean, like just about do you the rationing and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. I mean, but being in the, in the service, we didn't. You know, we we had food, we had clothes, we had entertainment. We didn't go through some of the hardships. I know my, mm -hmm. my what my mother and daddy would write to me how tough it was at home doing this, and they were bread was rationed. They could only have like a loaf a week and stuff, and. Uh, we used to, in, in fact, one time I came home from the service, this is before, the, the war was on, but I hadn't been in battle yet, mm -hmm. and I got to leave, time to come home, mm -hmm. before I have to go back and then go to leave. And my sister, her little boy was three years old and didn't know what chocolate was. Mm -hmm. And so from, the, our, our, from our army PX, I brought him a bunch of chocolate bars. Because it had been rationed, right? right. Because it wasn't that. Uh, another thing we used to get first, first cabin treatment from a, a general manager of a hotel in Portland because we would take nylon socks up for his daughter. You know, mm -hmm. nylons were all, mm -hmm. silk was all, everything was rationed. So that's all I can tell you about the, the hardships that I think they had, you know. Only so much gasoline and so much food and stuff like that. That's all I can think. But I think it was probably harder for you being in the service than for the people at home, even. You know? Yeah. Really? Because they were being shot at. We we uh, we didn't have problems in the army. You got the officers' rations, mm -hmm. and you couldn't. Yeah, I and another officer drove. From Ohio, all the way to Oregon, and we had enough gas coupons between the two officers. And back home, they were having like mm -hmm. four gallons of one. Mm -hmm. so, you know. I don't think people need, didn't need gas as much then, did they? No. They didn't go as far. But, you know, what do you think? That shoes were rationed. Mm -hmm. This was, so the civilians really had it tough. I, I think that was some of the incentive for the soldiers to want to really conquer. Right. You know, I got a wife at home, or I got a mother at home, or I got a lover at home. Mm-hmm. Now, you were not married at this time. No. We didn't know each other. You haven't met In the service, we didn't have this problem. Yeah, well, I think we, the whole idea of rationing was that the, the servicemen got first dibs on of everything. Yeah. Right, because they needed to. And I think people understood that. I don't think there was a lot of ill feeling. I don't think they could do that. Today. I don't know. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing you. I don't know whether people would put up with it today. They're more self-centered, I mean, quite right. frankly. We are societies is too soft to me. Mm -hmm. See, that was another thing. If you're asking about that, we had just come out of a tremendous economic depression, and as I know, we went in. And it was luxury to be in the service after what we lived through going, you know. Because I can, when I was, I always tell my kids, when I was 12 and 15 years old, before I had gone into the 
concerns. I used to always be hungry. They don't know what hunger is today. No. They have no idea what hunger is today. Hey, Bob, I was telling her about that young boy that she picked up over on the island. Yeah. Do you want to tell us about that little Filipino boy that you picked up on the island? Well, well when we landed on Lakey, that was our first battle. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the first night we landed, we had a fight to a little town. We had, it was pretty tough fighting. But what, what, when we had driven the Japs back and so forth, and we had kind of this little area we were sort of se secure. It was unbelievable the way older people and kids were just coming out of no place. And we could, how in the world could they live them the way we had bombed and everything? Mm -hmm. But they were, well, and my men, and not only my men, but all soldiers, always carried it in their gas masks or someplace. They had candy bars, and they started giving these out, and I, they almost kissed our feet. Mm -hmm. Well, then about the, the next day, we had a move, and we went for in our movie. We went ten days, and we're never out of knee deep water for ten days. And to sleep, we would sit back to back. You know, you always had some men on security watching. Mm -hmm. But when he did get to sleep, he sat back to back because the water was up to here. But we, when we finally emerged from that, they dropped food down to us and stuff. And we had to feed the Japs. And that's, that's when we made this tremendous movement around. And my picture there, my general was showing MacArthur where we were, and he said it's impossible. Nobody could be there. But that's we they, we went through this swamp and got around behind the Japs. And anyway, we had a my soldiers a, a, adopted a little boy, and he was with us for I guess three weeks before I even knew what was going on. He kind of hit him from us. And he was about nine years old, mm -hmm. and he, he he could only speak a little bit of English, but he, and, but primarily Spanish. And when we were going through the swamps, and we were three one, one place one area, we were three days without food at all. We didn't. We had to eat grasshoppers, mm -hmm. and we ate yes. like whatever was ed edible food. For the, before they got it to us. But this little fella knew pretty well and, and he would shake his head if the guys would want to eat like, let's say a dandelion or something. But the, you know, the, the grains, he'd shake his head and that wasn't good to eat. So, well, we, we adopted him, Pedro. And we said, but after I got to know him, and he always called me, Tell them what to do. That was my name. Oh. Tell them what to do. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, it was about, I guess, three weeks or so that we were moving out of the swamps and moving to higher ground. And we, we say, all of a sudden he got all excited and he told, he just loved my executive officer, this was Jimmy Redden. He was. He, he was killed in Okinawa, he wasn't killed in Lee. And he just loved him. And, but he, you know, he kind of scared me because I was telling him what to do. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> anyway, he got all excited and he started skipping and hollering. And he said, oh, oh, I'm going to see my mama. And she, we, we moved into this little town called Harrow, J-A-R-O, in Lee. And his father was the postmaster of this little town. And it was about oh, 12 or 1,500 people lived there in this little town. And he ran up and grabbed his mother and father. And then what they told us, they said when the Japs came, they were taking children and everything and making laborers out of them. Mm -hmm. And this little fellow ran off. And he said he, he ran and he ran and then he never knew how to get back home. Well, so it was hard. almost nine months oh when we God. 
I said, probably, they sort of wondered where he was, I expect. Or, but they probably, with all this going on, maybe they got, he got captured by the Japanese. But he ran down to the waterfront, and then he kind of lived down there as a little urchin or something. Then the white man adopted him and took him back. Of course, he stayed with him because he got food and food. Sure. And then after about, as I say, four or five weeks, maybe it was six, I don't know. But we got back and he held home, home. He recognized where he was, and then he ran to his mother. And his father could speak pretty good English. As I say, he was a postmaster. Mm -hmm. Then he told us, he said, oh, we're so glad. We thought Pedro was the goal of the Japs hitting or something. Mm -hmm. But they said when, the, when they came into that town, he just ran away with other boys. And he said, we, 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 we just, that was over nine months ago, we just gave him up as being dead. So we had a very, very happy reunion with these people. And, and I, should I tell them about the food? Sure. Yeah. Anyway, then Papa said, for bringing my boy home, would you come and eat with us some night? So we were stationed just outside this little town. So my, my buddy, Jim, my, Jim Redden and myself went in to eat. And we had a little coconut shells, like we had a saddle on the floor, a little grass shack. And we had the most delicious chicken soup. Oh, it was so good. Mm. And then she said, Mama said, only special people get to eat the meat, and you're special people. So she digged in this big early where she had got there, and she pulled out this chicken, and it had its head on and its comb and its feet. <laughs> so I guess she sort of got the flavor out of it somehow by cooking. We were almost ready to cook it. Yeah, I, I would think and so. I said, oh, Mama, thank you so much. But I said, we Americans only eat pork. We oh, don't eat chicken. Oh, vegetarian. <laughs> bless you, bless That's you. That's great. Well, then we got out of there. And you know that about seven years after I was out of the, uh, on, in the Philippines, in mm -hmm. peacetime in Sicily, I got a very tattered and really warm look, looked like it was. And it's, all it said on this was Captain Von Holly. United States Army, and the post office got that letter. Oh my took gosh. It took all these years to find me, and then I opened it up, and they said, Pedro was in school in Medela. The father wrote just the nicest letter to me. Hmm. But wasn't that remarkable? It was all it said, my, Isn't my that name. Isn't something? That didn't even amazing. say America, it just said U.S. Army. Isn't that something? But they finally found it and got it to me. Of course, we, I to this day I wonder what happened to little Pedro because mm -hmm. he, he's probably uh, 50 or 60 oh, years old. Sure. He'd be yeah. 60. Yeah, he was alive during the war. Mm -hmm. it's probably an old but anyway, man. that's one of, my, one of my favorite stories. Yeah, that's a happy story, sort of. Yeah. That's neat. So, yeah, we do have some good things to remember. Sure, sure. That. But I understand you're in the Hall of Fame at Fort Benning. Yes, I am. And how did that happen? How, I, how did you get into the Hall of Fame? Well, by a couple of decorations, but primarily why uh, you get in the Hall of Fame is, in my case, with the things I did in my civilian life. When I got home, I was. I was always involved in, the, in, in my community and stuff like that. Oh, okay. So that plus all, see I had, I had five decorations. Yeah. Obviously you had two purple hearts. Two purple hearts and a silver star. Oh, that's and impressive. A silver star, that's all in there. And a bronze star. Combat infantry badge. And all those things they had up. Mm -hmm. But then the, uh, the other, probably the critical, most critical thing is if you, gra if you have graduated from OC school and you may stick, get, attain the rank of colonel, that's enough. I mean, if you've got 
high enough so that that's what started looking for me then my decoration and what I did in community service. Well, that's pretty impressive, I'd say. All those things added up. Can you tell us how you got the Silver Star? Isn't that, that would be the highest of those medals, right? Yes, and the story's in there. I, I got that on the on place. And uh, we were pinned down is the, the word when, when the, they're firing enough at you that you can't move. And if you do move, they, they got, you're pinned down. I mean, they, they got the upper hand. And I uh, kind of went crazy seeing my men being shot up like that and everything. And I grabbed what they call a satchel charge, mm -hmm. which is a little dynamite thing. And I spotted the machine gun that was doing all this problem. And I ran through as it the withering fire. What I will tell you, I had four bulletins. I wasn't, I got one more carrier. Looks like a vaccination. But I had a bullet hole through here and a bullet hole through my shoulder and two through my pants. And the only thing I can think of or anybody else that when you run your your clothes is out mm -hmm. and a bullet didn't hit me that would go through my clothes. Oh my gosh, Isn't that amazing. And I dropped the satchel charge in. It blew up about twenty guys and then we could advance. But this is that thing said in the, the face of the enemy. But you know it, it's I guess it's the same reaction as if you see your kid drowning in her farm. Mm -hmm. These were all my boys and I loved them all. And I just went even well, well for me it's pretty impressive to talk about somebody who's actually done that. I mean we've all seen Audie Murphy movies and stuff, yeah. but to somebody who actually did that. First time he went to an army reunion of his group, we were married, and we went to Indianapolis. That's where the reunion was. And the first time this whole group had been together, and I came home and I, I see now why he's so close to one. Absolutely. They, they all cried when they saw each other, and they were they do that every year when they see each other. They're just, he said she never saw him. Uh, Men cry like that. Oh, all yeah, all so. sure. Do you still get together? Yeah. Well, that was our, I guess that was about six or eight years after the. After we got after married. We so we had every, yeah, we've been all over the country having, with him. Yeah. Every year we kept having him after that. And now, just this last year, we went to the last one was in Washington, D.C., and we dissolved because there's not enough. Living, but God bless them. Like my daughter and the other soldiers' sons have continued this. They've had they so started they their own this year. <laughs> 96 division, and they're going this year. They're gonna meet in Denver. Wow. So that's something that, that I think when I talk with other soldiers or in interviews like this. You can't, my unit, the 96th Division, were so welded together. We were like one family. You know, like a lot of these guys, and I've talked with them, oh yeah, I served with such and such, but they go to hell. You know, I'm just glad it's all over. But we were so welded together. Hmm. Just, you know, don't you? Uh -huh. Get me crying now thinking about it. Every, every year there was, well, out of, out of my, uh, I guess, 15 or 18 that were really survivors, you know, I mean, it, it, as the years went on, and now we're down to about three. I don't know why I'm still here. God has you there for a reason. Tell, tell the story again. Tell the story about jumping into the tree. Uh, 
<laughs> those, those are all individual stories. But I had a, about 50, and this was in Lady, and I had about 15 men with me on the, what we call a termite patrol. And a termite patrol is the, you're supposed to look and observe and find things out, but you're not supposed to fight. So you, some of them are supposed to go out, go out and get them and wipe them out. But this was a termite patrol, and we were trying to find a pass through the, as I say, from the swamps to the higher ground to get to the other side of Lakey. And I, I, I had these 15 men, and we went up, and I don't know if I can make you eat and understand, but we got up and it was like this big cliff, and it was, and to go back down, we had to go another day's walk to go back down, but we're on this cliff, and there was no way to get down, and it was about as high as, I guess, a two or three story house, up that high. And uh, no matter where we looked, there was no way to get down this. You've probably seen land like that, where there's yeah. cl cliffs. There's no way to get down. No way. So I sent one sergeant 15 minutes that way and told him, just go 15 minutes and come back. The other sergeant go 15 minutes and come back and see if he can find a place where we can go down. Well, they came back and they said, we can't find anything. So I said, well, I'll find something. I went to another six, six or eight hundred yard, and there was this big tree. And the tree was almost as high as the, where the land we were on. So I got the crazy idea. I said, I'll go first and we'll watch. So I threw all my gear down. The, you know, I ran and dove tree and we went and climbed down the tree and I said come on down. Well that worked then. Fifteen men we only got one broken arm. Yeah. Our clothes were torn and we scratched and everything they got but we didn't get down. That was very in inventive of you. Yeah. That's when I got the, the bronze star for leading that. There you go. Wow. I think that's pretty impressive. I think that we all appreciate, um, you know, your time and the fact that you're sharing all this with us. Uh, I'll end it there by saying, as of now, and this was, I, I did, a neighbor told me, saw it on the, uh, what do they call it, on the computer email? Web or something. <laughs> or whatever. As of and not, I not was, but as of now, I'm the most decorated soldier in the Commonwealth of Kentucky that's still Ooh. alive. That's fantastic. And now I did say one more thing. I don't know if you ever saw Lloyd Bridges' GI series. Mm -hmm, I've seen him. No, it was the Time Life yeah. Books series. Okay. He ran. Eight video stories like you guys are doing now. And one of them was about me, Boy Bridges. We'll have to look that up then. It was in, it's, if, if I was going to bring it over to the, to the video, it was called At the Emperor's Doorstep. And it was our fighting on Okinawa. Okay. And What's the name of the whole series? The G.I. Joe series. Yeah, I, I think there's eight or ten in and uh, Those sound interesting. Then we, then we gotta go. But because uh, mm -hmm. I, I am I'm always looking for new sources, you know. New actual yeah. well, well, footage too. Leave, leave you with a funny her little boys. You're twenty six today. Huh? He's 26 years old today. Okay, wow. so they, they were six, both eight, under six or eight. Six or eight. And they were watching this on television about the yeah. Grandpa Bob. And there, there's a scene there where they show, I wasn't in it, they had actors, but they were carrying a guy off on a street.
stretcher, and it says Captain Von Holly was wounded, but he still would live. He didn't say, it said he was wounded and ended up being removed, and it shows the stretcher taking me over to the airplane, which is, I went out on the ship, I didn't go on the airplane. And her little boy looked at me at that time, he was six years old, he said, Poppy, did you really die? <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh. no, I think I'm still here. Oh, that's uh, neat. <laughs> so. Well, like I said, I really appreciate talking to you. This has been great. I've had opportunities to talk to other veterans, but never this long. Okay. And you can have all that stuff for pictures. Well, I think that's actually the library. I would like copies of it, though. Give it to me somehow, so I can read a little bit about it. Okay. And you still live in Kentucky? Yeah. What? I married a Kentucky girl. That's what we got. There you go. But you were from Ohio. Ohio. Norwood, Ohio. Norwood. Okay. Pleasant Ridge most of my life. Sure. But I was born in Norwood. 1918. Ooh. Mm -hmm.